Welcome to The Conquering Truth. I'm Dan Horn. I'm Jonathan Sides. I'm Charles Churchill. And I'm Joshua Horn. After four or five years of relative peace in the Middle East, a couple weeks ago, war broke out again with uh, the typical, you know, Hamas sending rockets into Israel and Israel responding and doing damage to, to the Palestinians. And so as Christians, how should we be thinking about, about this conflict? And I would I'd say that the answer to that really is to just sort of outline some other issues that, that as, as Christians, specifically as American Christians, are probably at the forefront of a lot of people's minds. And one of them is to just say, hey, this is a conflict involving the political nation of Israel in the land of Palestine. Does that make it a special conflict? Is it different than other world conflicts because of those two elements? If you asked me that 10 years ago, or 50, no, 20 years ago now, I, I would have said, absolutely, it makes it different. And I grew up dispensational. I grew up with the view that, you know, that Israel was, that the nation of Israel, the political nation of Israel today are still the representatives of God's, or, you know, God's representative chosen people in the world. And so the Israel curse Abraham, you'll be cursed. If you bless Abraham, you'll be blessed. I mean, to the point where if you would ask me, and I, you know, because if they had said that if Israel attacked the United States, who should the church back? I would have said Israel. And I mean, and I think, and I don't know that, I'm not saying everybody's at that point, and I don't think I was even in that ridiculously a, strong comparative view that was held, but that was how strongly I would have held it. When there was actually aggression, if if Israel came in here, then obviously people would all of a sudden rethink that theology, because that theology I don't think could work in the real world. Right. And the reason it can't work in the real world is it doesn't match Scripture. I mean, the Bible does say that I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. But from Galatians, it's very obvious that he's talking about not those who are the the physical seed of Abraham, but those who have the same faith as Abraham. That is the seed. The seed is Christ. And, and I think I think this is something that we're going to – we plan to talk about in more detail in a, in a future episode, but uh, – so, so this is this we is we thought we would make answer. people angry ahead yeah. of them, just a pre-angry appetizer. Yeah. <laughs> and so, when we think about what the Bible actually says, there's there's warnings to Israel that if they disobey God, that He will punish them, and they will lose the land that was given. And even in doing that, He's very specific about why He'll do that. He'll do that because they do the same sins that the Canaanites did. And when Jesus Christ comes. They're doing all the same sins that the Canaanites did. And so God has a promise. It's in the the Song of Moses, and it's in Deuteronomy 28, 37, that says, And you, being Israel, shall be an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations where the Lord will drive you. God says that the Jews will be a special people. The Israelites will be a special people. But special because this is what happens to a people who who claim to be God's people and aren't. They're there as a warning to us that if we make a profession of faith, it's a false profession. It doesn't mean it goes better for you. It means it goes worse. So, so, so that sounds like everyone should go after the Jews then, just like they have all throughout history. Romans 11 is Paul writing going, obviously this is going to be the response. Somebody that knows the Bible is going to say, well, the Jews are supposed to be a proverb and a byword among all the nations. Everybody's supposed to look at them and go, this is what happens to a people, so let's, let's pile on. And Paul goes, no, 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 no. If the natural branches can be broken off, you can be broken off. We're supposed to see them as a warning. But if you can graft in a wild branch, certainly you can graft back in the natural branches. So as a people, as a nation they are, but as individuals, it's no different than any other individual they can come to faith. And so when we look at that group of people, it doesn't mean that we treat them differently. We should not treat them differently because God's very clear repeatedly in his word. He is without partiality. And it's in God's providence that, that this will happen and has happened. But it doesn't make the Nazis right for the concentration camps. It doesn't, I mean, that doesn't solve their sin. Glad we cleared that up tonight. It does not make the Nazis right, okay. If you're listening along at home, Nazis, bad. <laughs> but the point is, is that when we look at these things and look at what people are doing, 
because God is going to fulfill this doesn't mean that that gives us the right to break his laws. And his laws are crystal clear. You do not judge with partiality. He didn't judge with partiality. He judged the, the Canaanites the same as he judged the Israelis. He didn't judge with partiality, and we're commanded not to, too. When we judge with partiality, it's sin. If we're partial to the Palestinians, it's sin. If we're partial to the Israelis, it's sin. Judging with partiality is sin. I mean, and I think you can take this as any other thing that there's, you know, you can look at things that God says he'll curse and he'll bless or when he's going to cause displeasure to be, his displeasure to be poured out. And it doesn't give you freedom to go and, and I mean, where he says that he'll punish those who are fools, that they'll be destroyed. It doesn't mean you get to go and destroy fools. I mean, and so there's this part of it where God may work out in the world that these things happen. But if you go and you do that, he's going to judge you too. And so, and even if you look throughout history, those that God has used to show Israel as to be a watchword and a byword and to show these people to be this way, God has judged them and punished them for what they did. He does not reward them and, 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 and honor them for what they've done. And I think that's right. I think that's very clear. It's often that God will use a wicked nation to bring out his ends, and then he will turn and he will judge the wicked nation for their wickedness. Right. And I think this is an issue where there's been a long history of getting it wrong. I mean, you have... Obviously, I mean, there's a long history of anti-Semitism against the Jews, even in the Christian church. I mean, uh, people oh. get get quite upset with, you know, Martin Luther, and rightly so, I think, and some of the, the, the things that he said. And then now it's kind of shifted the other direction where most uh, most Christians think that Israel as a nation today is special. And that's... Can do no wrong. And can, yeah, yeah and, all, and all these things. So it's, it's kind of a, a tricky balance between them. Um, and yeah, and so this is this is probably not the full explanation of all the nuances of dealing with Israel, but it, it is some important things to remember. The the way you balance these things comes back to partiality, right? It says in James two eight and nine, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well, but if you show partiality, you commit sin, and are convicted by the law as transgressors. That's how we're supposed to do. We're supposed to judge justly. And as we think about this, you know, I think in other podcasts, I've mentioned Micah 6, 8, do justly, love mercy, walk humbly before your God. Do justly is the one that we are commanded to do. And that in that we love mercy, in that we walk humbly before God. But we're supposed to be a just people and to show partiality is to be unjust. What's the Bible saying when it's saying that we shouldn't be showing partiality? Because we just don't talk like that. That's not the kind of, of word that we use in just our normal language. It's not the kind of word that you hear in the media. It's not the kind of word that you even hear in legal settings where you might expect it. I mean, it, would it be appropriate to say that this is like you're not supposed to show favoritism? You're not supposed to be improperly biased? What? I think it includes all that, but more, right? It includes the idea that there is only one law. You don't say, we're going to judge this people according to this law, and we're going to judge this people according to this law. There's only ever one law. And when a country or a people or how you judge people where you get multiple laws, that gets to be a a real problem. And that's what real racism is. That's what real partiality is. It's where you go, I'm going to judge him differently because he's a Jew, because he's black, because he's Hispanic. Not that I'm not going to judge everybody, but if I come up with a standard that's just the black standard, then that is sin. That's judging with partiality. That would be systemic racism. That would be systemic partiality. But if I say, I'm going to judge everybody that walks around like... You know, that he looks violent and he looks angry, so I judge everybody that way, regardless of the color of the sin. That's not partiality. That's saying anger is a sin. And so when we start to make up multiple laws where we're looking at people and judging them differently according to other characteristics, that's when we're sinning. And even and even in the Old Testament where uh, Israel as a nation was a special people, even there— um, the, the, the law, broadly speaking, applied equally to the stranger as well as to the Israelite. Um, so, you know, even, even when Israel was a special people, you were, there, there was a level where they were supposed to be treated uh, equally with everyone else. And so d- just to be clear, I mean, laws like, you know, Jews can't own properly, property, that's a very partial law. Rules like, you know, people with 
dark enough skin have to sit on special train cars. That's partiality. Rules like if you uh, kill a black person and it seems like you may hate black people, you go to prison for twice as long. That's partiality. And so there, right. it partiality is kind of the the leveling that ev- everyone is is equal before the law. That there's no special groups one way or another. We're looking at our nation breaking down on racial things and kind of things like that. And we should recognize that this idea of dispensationalism in the church and that Israel's a special people that get special rules, that's just being manifest in the culture because the church has already accepted and has taught for 60 years. This is how you're supposed to look at it, even more, maybe 100 years. This is how you're supposed to look at it. You're supposed to judge with partiality. So again, like I've said in other podcasts and like I say frequently, when you look at the society, it's being driven by the light that the church is showing. And the church has been showing a very false light by saying it's okay to judge with partiality. And then we complain that the society is judging with partiality. Well, we taught them to. So some, a lot of what has been said so far is probably uh, pretty radical or controversial. He'll do a certain percentage of the listeners. Um, but you know, at this point, I think, from my perspective, I mean, we're kind of leaving that part behind, and that even if you think that Israel is the people of God, it doesn't mean that they can do whatever they want for whatever reason they want. Um, so even if you do think that Israel is, you know, a special people, I mean, it is. It does still matter. Are they acting righteously? Because if you look at the Old Testament, Israel is a special people, and they acted wrongly many times, and they were punished because of it. So I think you're gonna, you know, <laughs> look look that out. But that's not really, you know. That's really critical to the rest of what, what we're going to say here about the actual events that are unfolding in, in recent news. So if we go back and say, okay, how do, we, how do we judge a conflict? There has been since Augustine, so for what, 1,800 years or something now, there's been a theory called just war theory that's changed a lot and isn't necessarily that biblical in ways. But it's a, I thought it was a good way to kind of frame the discussion about whether this is a righteous thing to do. And so I thought it was worthwhile just going through these six points of just war theory and discussing, is this a just war? Is, is what's going on there right, both from the side of, of the Palestinians and the side of Israel? So the first one is, do you have a just cause? You're not allowed to go to war. You're not allowed to start killing people unless you have a just cause. So the argument, I think, is the Palestinians have a just cause because the Israelites drove them off of their land back in 46 or whatever it was, 47. Is that a just cause? A disclaimer to put out here is that, you know, Middle Eastern politics and Israeli-Palestinian politics in particular is very complicated. Um, So, uh, and I don't think anyone here would present themselves in any way as an expert on those topics. So, uh, yeah, perhaps some things maybe take with a grain of salt. But that being said, I think one one critical point here is the question of can you, um, because of ancestral claims of land from a long time ago, go attack people? Um, And I think, you know, you look at how... uh, God treats claims of land, and there are certain times where certain people are given particular lands. And, you know, the most obvious example of being Israel being given the promised land. The actual violence in terms of military activity was the Palestinians attacking Israel, in, I mean, in the terms of the last few weeks. So if, if Palestine is thinking we can go attack Israel, they're trying to overthrow the government of Israel, I mean, broadly speaking, in, in terms of their long-term goal. So can you go just attack a nation because you have some ancestral claims to the territory. Well, you look at what the Bible says. You have where the Babylonians conquer Israel. And so Israel is been given this land as the promised land. Jeremiah, they're told, submit to the Babylonians. And so even though this is your land, submit to them. And they weren't supposed to rebel against them. Eventually, God gave them the land back without their, them needing to use military force. So the idea that you may have a just cause because of some historical territorial claims to start a war, it doesn't seem very valid to me. And I mean, especially when you're looking back, I mean, from Israel's perspective, because Deuteronomy 28 that we read about them being an astonishment and a byword and a a watchword through the earth, that right before that it says, I will remove them off of the land and send them back to Egypt. So for them to look at that claim, that's not a legitimate claim. But 
the way they got established there. They are now an established nation there, and their establishment is no better or worse than how the Arabs were established there before that. And so we want to look at it and go, oh, they drove them off because it happened 70 years ago. Well, how did those Arabs get there in the first place? Well, they drove off other people. And before that, other people were driven off. And, you know, you go back to the Crusades. That used to be a, a very Christian area of the world, and they got driven off. I mean, this is, you know, you don't see the church in America going, this is our territory. We get to go bomb Israel and, and Palestinian. That's, that's not Palestine. That's not how it works. And you don't have the right when God has established a country— by whatever means he established it, you don't have the right to just say, we're going to try to conquer the land. And you, and I think you look at Romans 13, and the message from Romans 13 isn't go back and dig through thousands of years of history to figure out who the legitimate authority is over me right now and then submit to them. The thing is, there is an authority God has placed over you because God is putting the authorities in place. And so, you know, in a sense, the status quo is the legitimate authority because that is— that, that's who, who God has put over and God has given the authority of that over that land at that po- point in time. Not that there's not a point where authorities need to be m- removed, um, but if you're asking who the legitimate authority is, it's normally a pretty easy, easy question to answer. And in here, it's not even the Palestinian authority, from my understanding. It's more Hamas. So you even question how much of it's the nation versus a group in the nation that's that's doing the missiles and who are also the, missiles, the government of- <laughs> which is also the major right, party in the government so it gets very confusing very is this the government is this a, a political party that's doing this but either way it seems to me that they didn't have the provocation that, that warranted sending missiles into to particularly Israel. when you look at the fact i mean there's part of a just cause is are you fighting a military conflict as opposed to sending missiles in to hit hospitals and sending missiles in to hit you know i mean your their target was we're civilians. And so, I mean, there, there's a big part of it where if you just say, I want to go in and I just want to go in and indiscriminately kill people in this country, that's very different than even saying I'm trying to subjugate the nation. Right. Right. So if you turn that around, you know, does Israel have a just cause against Hamas? I mean, rockets coming into your country um, that you didn't start. <laughs> I hope that's Seems a just like cause. A pretty, it doesn't get much juster than that. I mean, how many rockets would have to land in major American cities uh, before the U.S. declares war on somebody and invades them. 9-11, right. we went and, and said, well, that means we can take <laughs> over Afghanistan. That means we can you know, we can go into right. Iraq. I mean, we did a lot based on that idea. And whether we were proportional, I find it hard to believe we were. But right. but um, it's still, and we'll we talk about that later. We basically said harboring but, al-Qaeda was the equivalent of declaring war on the United States. Right. I mean, and so, I mean, so you can, it's, The point isn't to adjudicate that. It's to say, if you say that they don't have a just, you know, they can't be just, you really have to question what is a just response. And again, partiality and judgment or being impartial in judgment says if the same thing happened to us, would we say it's okay to do the same thing? And we know as a nation what we've said. So if and not just us, because, you know, the United States frequently stands pretty alone with Israel, but other nations need to be going well, if we got if we had three thousand missiles sent at our biggest city, would we respond? Would we invade? Would we bomb them? And I think there's no question that the answer would be yes. Right. And so there's some real, you know, the UN and the the things that they want to pass and the resolutions. I mean, there's there's real sin there that we need to recognize that these nations are declaring things that that aren't true. They would not hold themselves to the same standard. Right. And the reason it's it's useful to start having this discussion in terms of just war theory is not really an academic exercise so we can walk through just war theory. It's to it's to dislocate us from the idea of thinking, oh, whose side are we on as we observe a conflict that's happening halfway around the world? Because if you want to just talk about whose side we're on, are we are we pro Israel, are we pro Palestine, are we pro Hamas? You know, y- when you do that you are bound to judge with partiality. You're not going to mm-hmm. be. You're not going to have the option of judging justly because you're not going to be judging by principles. You're going to be judging by association. Every one of us at this table, and and my guess is every one of our listeners, we've been trained to think that way with partiality. I mean, you just you can watch any movie right now, and the movie's going to tell you who the good guys are, who the bad guys are, and you are going to be trained that it's okay for that good guy to steal a car if they really need to to escape 
Right. You know, you've you've been taught that, oh, if this person's on my side, then I can accept anything that they do, as opposed to saying, no, is this the right thing? Is this the wrong thing? And judging it objectively. So you can disagree with us at the end of the day about any one of the particulars. We can have a discussion about facts as long as it's actually about facts and not just about whose side are we on. Right. Because we don't want to have that discussion. That discussion is not fruitful, and that discussion is just going to further divide us and the world apart. If, if, if Israel just suddenly shot missiles into Palestine, we would say that was wrong. I mean, you know, I mean, if, if, if I, this was reversed, Israel would be wrong. And if we went step by step through all of Israel's, I mean, I guarantee you they did a lot of things that were wrong. Right. So we're just talking about a very narrow slice and not not having a 36-part uh, series on <laughs> the entirety of Israel's relations. Right. But I I'm, mean, I'm, I'm, I've read things they've done wrong, but right. it's not kind of outside of our scope today, right. at least so far. Right. <laughs> at least. I mean, in we'll this, this, this current conflagration, right, I mean, it's it's – it seems to me that it's really hard to say that Israel didn't have the right to respond. Right. And now I think one of the other things that's going on, though, is that, you know, in this kind of shifts over time, but you see kind of even, you know, critical race theory and that kind of things are starting to apply, too, because all the people that are pro-critical race theory are going, but the Palestinians are poor. So it's wrong for Israel to respond that this is, this is race supremacy, and we just need to recognize that all these things tie together and everybody kind of grabs their favorite theory the way that they want to look at the world and start to apply it. And Christians need to be going back and saying, how does God say we're to look at the world? So the second principle, if the first principle is, that, you know, was there a just cause for the war? The second principle is, was war a last resort? Was there something else that could have been done in this response? Do we think that that applies here for either side? I mean, uh, for, for, for Israel, I mean, someone's launching missiles at you, and this is something that has gone on and off for decades. I don't think a phone call is going to fix this problem. Right. And I, don't, I think there's a part of it where being a last resort is talking about engaging. It's not necessarily talk about responding. And so, I mean, I, I do think there's a part of it. I mean, and, and it, there is an aspect of it in response. You know, is, right. Did some, they accidentally launch some rockets at you? I right. Mean, that's a— that's a different situation. Right. But I mean, but there's this part of it where when it's when someone is clearly attacking you, the, this is about the party who initiates. This is largely about the party who initiated the conflict. And so I think mo this one mostly needs to be directed at the initiators in this case. Right. I mean, in just war, I think it does apply to both parts, but you're, you kind of get a pass right away on whether, you know, it's a last resort. Well, if you've been attacked, it's pretty much your last resort is to defend. Right. No, I mean, right. It, That's yeah, economy. it's kind of a... Yeah, but I think a lot of the other ones do, but but this one does not, right? right. I mean, if you were like even just cause, if if uh, you know you invaded and then you retreated and they didn't attack, and then later they built up strength enough to attack and they attacked, well, they have a just cause. You came and invaded their country, even if it wasn't that recent. And so we need to, you know, just attacking doesn't mean all the other ones go away. Right. But certainly in this case, it seems to me as soon as you're attacked, you're kind of in the last resort. Right. Resort. And for Hamas. And the Palestinians, I mean, if they're saying Israel should not exist as a nation, the only way they're going to accomplish that is by force. So for them, it's the last resort as well. I mean, when we think of the last resort, though, it's really easy for people to always say it's the last resort. But the reality is, is that the Palestinians and the Israelis, the Palestinians have been offered a nation multiple times where the where they, they even came to an agreement with multiple parties and, and then they basically rejected it as a people. And so it's really hard to say it's the last resort for them. Unless what you're saying is we need to kill all the Jews. Or drive them all out of Palestine. And then you kind of go back to the number one. You kind of go back to, you know, you've already failed the just cause. I mean, it, it is sort of a chain, right? I mean, it's... Right. I mean, it's, it's you can't go... You, you well, oh, it's, it's, I, I really want to murder him. So, you know... So this <laughs> is the only way I can go about doing it right. is to... Yeah. I mean, the idea is you need a six out of six, not right. five out of six even. <laughs> right, right. If you go and you read the uh, the Declaration of Independence and you read the, the 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 full document, and you read about the things that the American the, the the people in the American colonies had put up with from their leader from the king prior to declaring their independence, 
it's a really long list. And, and so there's this part of it where I think when you look at being a last resort, I think people, you can do it two ways. Somebody goes, well, couldn't you just put up with it a little longer? And a last resort doesn't mean how long can you put up with it. It means it's actually a way of thinking about things. What have you done? What steps have you gone through? Have you allowed that step to come to fruition in a reasonable way? And, you know, and, and have you gone through a process to reach that point? The third principle in just war theory is that the war itself was declared by a proper authority. In this case, did anybody declare war? And if they did, were they were they an appropriate authority to declare that war? Right. And I mean, and I think again, with you look at the the biblical basis for this idea, it would be if you go to besiege a city, the first thing that you have to do is is say, are you going to surrender? That's the declaration of war. Because if you look otherwise biblically, there's there's not really that concept of declaration of war. But there is a cause, uh, a demand to for a call to surrender. And I think there's a part of it where where you could say it's it's biblical in the sense of things should be done under authority, things should be governed, things should be done decently and in order, and God has established authorities. And so there's this part of it where you don't get to abdicate, you don't get to go. Well, this this guy with a sword hit this other guy with a sword. So I guess our whole nations have to fight until the other one, you know, is, there's a point where you, the authority might step back and go, no, the, the guy on our side, we're going to punish him for attacking right. you. And you know what I mean? And this, this doesn't have to become a war. Right, which it, is pretty critical. I mean, you, you shouldn't have a terrorist group that's in your country going attacking other countries. Right. I mean, that, and that, you know, and that was part of the legitimacy of the argument against Afghanistan, for instance, is that they were har- harboring the Taliban. So that meant, that you know, the argument was, therefore, it's valid to do this because they had a duty internally to constrain it. They didn't constrain it. Did did the United States ever actually declare war? No. We just went to war. Right. Which, I mean, I mean, hey, well, like you said, it has to be done by the proper authority. And we live in a nation where we say we're governed by laws, and the laws say that Congress has to declare war. I mean, Congress hasn't declared war in the second half of the 20th century what was, the, was was the world was war ii last world last war ii was the last that was time. the last so okay i was thinking korea i was no, so, world war ii uh, korea was declared by the un even as we're discussing this thing that's happening around the world we have a problem with this we don't we don't, we don't really, want to be lawful we don't want to obey our own laws we just want to go in and and get involved in a whole bunch of fights that are even called wars. Well, I know the American question is, did we win? So if, you, uh, if you're interested in uh, why, what about America? What are our wars just, you know, stick around for a couple years if we're still doing the podcast. I'm sure we will find another country to invade. Not as the podcast, as America. <laughs> and in the interest of not showing partiality, not just judging Israel and Palestine, if the United States gets involved with another conflict that hits the news, we probably ought to talk about it right? and have this same kind of discussion. Moving on to number four is uh, that you, for just war theory, is that you have to, des- are you desiring a just result? What is a just result? A result that, jo- that God says is, is righteous, right? I mean, that's what it means, a righteous result. Can it just mean that you want to bring them into the American empire or can you? <laughs> and <laughs> if we if, if we just conquer them and bring them in, we'll be able to give them health care and we'll be able to give them all the and things it, that and we And it have. gets to be complicated because sometimes if you look, and I'm not saying I would agree with this, but if you look at like Saddam Hussein where the media was portraying it that he is this cruel monster, what they don't say is that he was propped up by the United States for 20 years before these things happened and the weapons that he was using were from the United States and all this other stuff. But they go, he's this cruel monster and we have to deliver the people. So the question is, is is it a just cause if there really is somebody, say somebody was saying, we're going to put all Christians to death, all those who truly profess Christ, can that be a just cause to go, we're going to invade to stop that? That gets to be a more complicated question. I think kind of the, the just result goes back a lot to the just cause. So you, you have it's a, a chain, like we said. Right. And you, so you have a just cause, and, what, and you can't have a cause like, well, you're holding our people in captivity. So therefore, we are going to kill every man, woman, and child in the country. That is a, maybe a potentially a just cause, but if they surrender the people, then the war should be over. You should be desiring a just result, not desiring something that is far beyond what the result Right. For, that matches your cause. There could be a just cause that the just re, the result that you're looking for is not just. Right. And Hamas in particular is saying 
that the result they want is to destroy all of all the Israelites. I mean, right. that's that's clearly unjust. Right. And so even if even if you look at the statements that they're making about why they have to do this because they're being you know subjugated by Israel, that doesn't give them the right to to go for what end they're going for. And so if you're if you're keeping score. So far, Palace. If you have to get six out of six, so far we don't think they they've they've lost four so far, and we've only covered four. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joshua said they got one, <laughs> but yeah, three, but three, three, three point five, <laughs> maybe, maybe three point five, right? right. <laughs> but what about Israel for this one? Are they desiring a just result? Right. Well, I think I think kind of the result, the immediate result would be then. Hamas stopping launching rockets. I think if Hamas was actually going to stop launching rockets, they would stop responding. Um, now, do they want to take all the Palestinian land? I'm sure there's some people in Israel that do. Is that a just result? Maybe. I mean, I don't know. It's that's it's pretty complicated. I don't know, but you start to get into the fact of 70 years of war, and you start to go. There's a point where the just result is more than just let's stop it for a couple of years. And and I really question how much of a just result is let's let's just get everything back to the status quo so that we'll have this break out. And it can be very unjust to leave something in a, an evil status quo. You know, I mean, it, it can be unjust to continue to allow some. I mean, and there's this part of it where I mean, it's you know, you're saying there are there are times in war where people weren't willing to push hard enough early on to achieve a result, and if they had, the war could have been over four or five years before. And really, the cost of four or five years was because they weren't willing to end the war. And like you look at things like the Hundred Year War, or things like that, where they they play this game of war, like you're saying, where they right. pre, you know. And so there there's a part of it where the last resort means you actually you actually seek peace, and peace can be obtained through war. Right, and and. Conquering has fallen on hard times in, <laughs> in international opinion. I mean, but you look at some of the, the <laughs> well, you look at some of the biblical laws of war and the laws related to um, when they're not attacking the Canaanites who they're supposed to exterminate. The the the, the laws aren't that you kind of just have this limited war and then you try to just get peace as soon as possible. I mean, some of the laws are you go and you conquer a nation and you make them a subsidiary territory of you and now they are part of your kingdom. And, you know, I'm not saying that nations should be going around conquering each other, but there are times that that is appropriate. Right. And not not that it, it is this one necessarily, but it's... But, uh, but to be fair, it's hard for me to see another situation where... I mean, there's been such prolonged war for such a long period of time. And to say that you can just go back to the status quo, that just doesn't seem to me to be very just. I'm just not sure, you know, something needs to give. And the people who suffer the most here, right, we, you know, the missiles are coming into Israel and they have all these defenses so that they've lost, I think, as of today, something like 10 people. And the Palestinians are in over 300 people because they don't. And so... The people who are really suffering are the Palestinians that aren't in the political things, that aren't into this, that that the UN is doing things to maintain the status quo, the Palestinian government is, the Israeli government is, the U.S. government is. And we just need to recognize that that keeping this as it is is not just. Right. How long have the Palestinians been in UN? Have there been UN detention camps or, you know, what do they call them? Over 70 years. Yeah, they're in the third generation. Yeah, I mean, so, I mean, this is a horrible way to say that a people can live, to say that this is the state we're going to leave you in, and we believe this is the state you should continue to live in. The next point in just war theory is having a reasonable chance of success. So does anybody at the table think that when the Palestinians started to attack Israel that they had a reasonable chance of success? If they were going to be successful, wouldn't they have been successful the other times they tried? I don't even know that having a reasonable chance of success should even be in here. Um, I mean, this it kind of takes away any idea that there's a cause that is hopeless and yet you still need to be fighting for it. It takes away the idea that there is a sovereign God who can grant victory to people who have no reasonable chance of success. Is this one of Aquinas' amendments? Is this Weren't the first yeah, four of these the, written by Augustine and then... Aquinas revisited. I'm not even sure that the third one was Augustine. Okay. I mean, and I would agree with you if you look at somebody like like Gideon 
where he's supposed to take 300 and everybody would go, he has no reasonable chance of success against the Philistines. That's not what God actually says. What God actually says is do what's right and do what's just. Well, there should I be mean, an asterisk when God if tells God you. says, then you <laughs> can you have assume you have a reasonable chance of success. I mean, if God says march around the city for seven days and then march around it seven times on the seventh day, I mean, that's never made walls fall before, but we'll do it. But you but, also have like Lot in his in his house. He doesn't have a reasonable success to defeat the entire city of Sodom attacking his house, saying, you know, send the man out. But it doesn't mean that he should send people out to be assaulted by the by by the by the men of the city. So you you have time. I think there are examples where it's not God divinely saying you must do this where you should do something that is unreasonable and that there, there really is a sense in that how you think about this one really depends on matters of faith and your perception right. of the providence of god reasonable chance of success well that's some kind of a metric and is your metric a set of human metrics or is it a set of, of godly ones and if it's a set of godly ones, well, then, you know, you look at the first four and you say, hey, are we really doing the just thing here? And if we're doing the just thing here, then, well, maybe one can put a thousand to flight because that's what God says, even though their numbers are a lot more than ours. Sometimes that's that's the uh, calculus that you do if you're trusting God in the midst of warfare. With a, with a just cause, no uh, chance is unreasonable. Right. Yeah. If, if it's a as God defines a just cause, well, then you know, this one's almost already assumed in the other ones. Because sometimes you can say, well, I have a just cause. I have these things, like when Assyria invades Israel and wipes them out, right? They get destroyed. They're no longer a nation afterwards when the northern kingdom is invaded by Assyria. And, you know, Israel could say, we didn't really do anything against Assyria, but at the same time, God had warned them over and over again that they were in sin, and they right. didn't do anything, and so God wipes them out. And so there, should you fight to the last man? No, because God made it very clear, this nation's in sin and needs to repent. Right. Right, and Israel had a just cause. I mean, when the Babylonians come against Jerusalem, Jerusalem has the—they're the, on the right— they, they, they have, you know, justice would say they shouldn't be conquered, but God's justice, he's using them— the Babylonians for a purpose. And, and in that case, to fight to the last man now, God said it to Jeremiah, tell them to go to Babylon, so you weren't supposed to do it. But even without that, there's a point where you go, this nation's pretty sinful. I shouldn't be fighting. Even if our cause is just, it doesn't mean that this not isn't just chastisement from God, which says we don't have a reasonable chance of success. In this narrow view, it's just. But in the wider view, as a nation, we deserve judgment. So the last one in the traditional just war theory is to that that your war is proportional in the means used, you know. But this this is another one that I think is questionable to say the least. Um, and I think this war is quite proportional. I mean, broadly speaking, Hamas launches rockets at Israel. Israel deflects some of them. Israel launches airstrikes against Hamas. Very proportional. However, is that is that how things are supposed to be? And I mean, I think even with uh, AP building and stuff where where Hamas had their, you know, some headquarters, allegedly, allegedly the president has President Biden has accepted their evidence and other national leaders have accepted the evidence that Hamas was there. AP even knew about it and hit it. And they still call ahead and say, make sure everybody's out. And they give them an hour's warning before they destroy the building. And there's a way that that's very proportional. But is that what you should really be doing? If you're at war, to some extent, it makes war this minor thing. Instead, it doesn't feel like the last resort. If you can call somebody up on a cell phone and say, you have an hour to evacuate and then we're going to destroy it. It doesn't feel like you're at the point where you were talking about last resort, where what else are we supposed to do? Proportional well, <laughs> response seems to be a lead up to war. You know what I mean? It, there's a part of it where as the process of working through war, there's up to the last resort. That makes perfect sense in those points. But once you go to war, the point is not to be proportional anymore. In fact, the point is, is for you to defeat them right? <laughs> totally non-proportionally. Well, the question is, can you have limited wars where there's multiple levels where you're just responding to the other person? You're holding back a lot of your resources, a lot of your abilities to defeat the enemy. And that, I think, tends to have wars that last a very long right. time. That seems to be much more related to maintaining the status quo than... 
we would say that there's there's cases where being proportional in your response is in conflict with some of these other principles. It's in right. conflict with desiring a just result. You know, if, if one of the things you want in a just result is peace, well, oftentimes getting to peace as quickly as possible is is the just thing to do. Right. And if that's the case, well, then being proportional is not one of your virtues. God tells us specifically even about what you're supposed to do when you besiege a city. Deuteronomy 2, 12 through 14. Now, if the city will not make peace with you, but war against you, then you shall besiege it. When the Lord your God delivers it into your hands, you shall strike every male in it with the edge of the sword. But the women, the little ones, the livestock, and all that is in the city, all its spoil, you shall plunder for yourselves, and you shall eat the enemy's plunder which the Lord your God gives you. I don't think most people would say this is a proportional response. But this is what God commands. Because God actually hates war. (laughs) I mean, he uses it, and it's a tool, and it's a tool that he uses for judgment. But but God is doing things so that there isn't continual war. Well, man actually kind of likes war. We would like this thing of, well, you can't just let Israel wipe out the Palestinians because that would be horrible. Instead, we keep a 70-year war where everybody for 70 years is living under a constant threat of war. God actually says the right thing to do is go and kill every male, and that'll solve the problem. God's point is by the time is that war should be such, such war is such a horrible and last resort of a thing that once you go to war, the point of it should be it should be so horrible that no one else should want to go to war with you. Yeah, we're supposed to take dominion of the earth, and you're not supposed to destroy the dominion mandate in doing war, versus the idea that we should just keep it so that everybody can keep going to war. That let's have a war season, and granted that was. That happened with Israel, but that's not a good thing. That's not what we're supposed to be doing as a people is looking for, you know, Jesus Christ is the prince of peace. He's not the prince of war. Which president wasn't they used the phrase military and military industrial complex? Eisenhower. You can't have a military industrial complex and not love war. I mean, there's just a part where it just it doesn't work. There's a reason why in our Constitution we're allowed to have a standing Navy and not a standing army. Because if you don't have a standing army, it's, it's hard very wait. hard to conquer and keep other lands. With just a navy. With just a navy. And it takes a while to ramp it up. But an army, if you have a standing army, what everybody knew that we've all forgotten is if you have a standing army, it gets used. Right. That's what happens. And so the way to, to not have constant war is to not have a standing army. That you should do what it says in the Bible, what it says in Deuteronomy, is that when you go to war, you gather up the men and you go to war. But you don't just have them always there as an army because that just leads you in the position where you'll be constantly going to war. If we haven't already made people angry, I mean, there's a part of it where one of the other things within the church is, and it's not, it is not wrong to support the troops. It is not wrong to do that. But we, it is very easy for politicians to leverage, support the troops into support whatever we have the troops do to say that whatever we have the troops do is good and there's a difference between those two things and and there's i mean and to say that that soldiers don't have a responsibility to say that people who are leaders in the military don't have a responsibility they do they they really do if they're officers they absolutely do and so i mean there's this part of it where we've the, the the church and the American people do too because yes. we sent them and so you I look do. at what happened and, right. right I mean exactly it comes down to very individually do we speak out when we go and we commit things that are clearly unjust war and you know you look at like what happened when people came back from Vietnam and people were spitting on them because they got sent to Vietnam right. but the nation sent them to Vietnam right. and so why are you taking it out on the soldiers that's right. not the they're not the problem they're not the primary problem right but the church really does need to speak about these things because if we're the light, if we're the salt, it, it is our duty to speak out about these things. I think one thing worth mentioning in the scripture you're alluding to or is talking about uh, the laws of war, how women and children are not supposed to be the target of the war. I think that's something that is worth mentioning that in, in, from what I've seen, Israel is, goes above and beyond in doing this, where they're calling people, if they're going to bomb a building, they're calling them, they're as they have their, uh, their planes overhead, they're looking and when if they see women and children running out of the building, they hold off destroying the building. Um, and they, they even develop a new uh, technique where they drop 
small bombs on the roof of the building uh, to let people know that this is about to be bombed <laughs> and then come back later and actually destroy it. So, I mean, it just seems like in that aspect, they are going, you know, to the limit. They're, they're coming up with new weapons to do this versus Hamas. Not, not so Specifically much. Specifically because on. they're fighting a force that intermingles themselves in with civilians right. to use civilians as shields. Right. And, it would, I mean, and, I mean, it, and they might even be justified to just simp simply bomb these places. But not, not that they shouldn't do what they're doing. But right. it, it would be hard to condemn them for destroying rocket sites even if right. there are casualties. Because, I mean, any war there are, it affects the civilians. It's inevitable. But Especially when Hamas specifically is going to residential areas to fire from. I mean, there's a lot that goes on there, too, in terms of, you know, what AP was doing. I'm not sure that they did the right thing because AP, there's there's reports coming out now from multiple witnesses that say that AP would specifically, they'd take pictures of the women and children that got hurt. And then when they start to bring the soldiers back that got hurt in previous conflicts, they won't take pictures of them. So they pretend like the Israelis just shot women and children. And so they're participating in furthering the war. And at some point you go, you're participating in furthering the war. I'm not sure the right thing to do is to call them. One of the cleverest things that I think the Israelites did in this, this war was, was uh, you know, they, they announced that their ground troops are engaged. And the way that's reported in the media is their ground troops have invaded. And so Hamas brought all their troops to the front line, <laughs> to the border, and then they strafed the border so that they could separate the Hamas soldiers from the civilians. And so, like you said, they are doing all kinds of techniques, but part of it is because of the reporting that goes on and the bias and the reporting that goes on that they're trying to say it's all these women and children. And so Israel's trying to do things to say, no, we're very specifically targeting the Hamas fighters. Right. But in the end, how does this ever end? We had a long discussion about the, and I don't know how much of it's going to be in the, in the <laughs> up being off mic, but we had a long discussion about the the desiring a just end here, and and it's a really difficult thing to desire a just end when you've got two parties that neither one of them really believe in the one true God. Right. And let's just say that neither one of them, neither the Arabs nor the Israelis, believe in the one true God. And when you don't do that, when you're not trying to actually achieve God's justice. It's, re it's going to be really, really hard, and it's going to be complicated, and it's going to be difficult, and it's going to continue being bloody. And I, I mean, this is kind of my theme for every podcast we do, but the only way that you solve a bloody conflict like this is with the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, until people are willing to submit to, hey, there's one person who died for all you're going to continue having human conflict until at least one side or a significant portion of one side is willing to bow the knee to Jesus, you're going to continue having these kinds of conflicts. If you want to end all wars, if that's, if that's your goal, if you want to end this particular war, then you need the Prince of Peace. And, and I know that sounds like a pat Christian answer, but, but it's, I'm saying it here at the end of a long and complicated discussion where we're barely scratching the surface of how long and complicated this could be because that's really the only generic right. solution that's going to work in any specific case. And you, and look, at, uh, and you look at a lot of the, the issues at play here, international law, just war theory, um, even the United Nations— all of these are because of all the Christian principles that have been propagated through the world. The idea that you're not just supposed to go attack other nations that might make right. I mean, that is all coming back to Christianity. Now, some of it has become very twisted where, you know, you have the UN is, if you look at the number of statements that are against Israel, is kind of an anti-Israel group in a lot of ways. But, but, the, but the, the only way they have any way to say that, any way to claim that a war is unjust and that you cannot just oppress people because you're able to is because of biblical principles that have gone through the world and have been distorted somewhat but it is you know there there has been there has been progress over over the last millennia and yeah when you look at look at islam islam says you can kill the infidel islam says it's fine to wipe everybody out and and that's definitely not the christian teaching but at the same time we need to recognize what, what the church is doing because it does come back to what the church is doing. The church isn't saying the solution is the Prince of Peace. The church is saying a bunch of unbelievers are the solution. Israel should have success. I will bless those who bless you. 
And right. so therefore, you shouldn't do anything against Israel. It doesn't matter if they have Christ. Right. Well, that's totally contrary to the scriptures. That's totally contrary. We need Christ in the, the view of the dispensational view in the church that Israel is great because it's Israel. Well, no, it needs Christ. And they've, they won't have peace without Christ. And the church needs to stop lying to them right. and say they can have peace without Christ. Kind of in summing up a lot of things that we've said, there's a, a few things worth reminding our, our listeners that, that we mentioned earlier, that uh, on one hand, you can disagree with us on the particulars of any of these sorts of things, as long as you're willing to come to it with the perspective of, what does the Bible say is just? And we can have that discussion. We can disagree on the facts because, hey, the information that you're getting out of there, it's all very distorted. Who knows what what's actually being said is right. You are dealing with a war here, so the actual parties are interested in hiding their motives and their intentions. So, so those it's all very difficult to tease that out, and we can have those kinds of debates as long as both of us are willing to go back and say, hey, what does the Bible say is right? What does the Bible say is just? And then based on the knowledge we have. So we can do that. But then the other thing is we've assumed a lot in this. We've made a lot of, of we've, we've used a lot of biblical principles as premises that we haven't taken the time to exposit or really defend the principles themselves. And those are going to be worth having a longer discussion in, in a later podcast or podcasts to, to, to discuss. Right. Things like why isn't it, you know, why isn't Israel the tro- still the chosen people of God? And who is, you know, who is? And some of that starts to touch on eschatological issues. And, I mean, there's there's a lot of different specific things to, to actually unpack there. Even even more things about just partiality itself. I mean, there could be uh, there, there could be a lot more fruitful discussion just about that and how to think about that properly. And, hey, I mean, even with where America fits in all of this and thinking of that. Oh, we're the chosen people of God. <laughs> <laughs> we could have a really interesting podcast about that. As we think of these things, it's important to get back to base concepts. The justice is justice. And we, it can't vary. It can't be with different people. It can't be in different things. So when we judge America, when we judge Israel, when we judge the Palestinians, when we judge Afghanistan, when we judge Iraq, as the church and as people of God, we have a real duty to make sure that we're being just and that we're not, we're doing everything we can to suppress our own biases. And I mean, I think that's a big issue that sits under all this. It is really important for us to understand that we are supposed to judge justly. And to judge justly is not to say Christians are held to a lower standard or the Jews are held to a lower standard. It's to judge everybody with the same law because God is a just God. Thanks for joining us. This has been The Conquering Truth, a project of Reformation Baptist Church. If you found this helpful, you can visit us online at theconqueringtruth.com and subscribe here or in your favorite podcast app. Thanks for watching.